What is management? Well, as you might imagine, there are quite a few different definitions of management, depending on your perspective. You know, academics have one perspective, business professors have another, uh, sociologists have another. What we're concerned about here is practitioner level uh, information and a practitioner level definition of management. That is, from the point of view of a fire officer or a police supervisor, what is management, how does it apply to me? And the definition we're going to be using is on slide six. Management is the art and the science. Art and science. There's some not completely well-defined stuff, there's some intuitive stuff, and there's some very well-defined stuff about management. And the craft of accomplishing goals, that's the primary purpose of management, is you have a goal and you need to accomplish it. You and your team need to get that thing done. So accomplishing goals is what management is all about through the supervision of other people. It's not you jumping in and doing everything necessary to accomplish that goal. You're accomplishing something by the supervision of other people. A quick little side note here on the difference between management and supervision. I mean, supervisor is a term we hear a lot in public safety uh, rather than manager. You know, sergeants, for instance, in the police force are often referred to as supervisors. The difference is managers are involved in the accomplishment of goals, so, and oftentimes in the actual setting of the goal itself. Whereas a supervisor is primarily concerned with having their people follow procedure correctly. And, and, and supervision is really more of an administrative activity than a management activity. Clearly these two activities overlap, but they are distinct, and what we're talking about in this program is primarily management, not supervision. The process of management has four elements. We're going to look at each one individually. But the four elements are setting goals for your organization, for your team. Secondly, formulating plans that achieve those goals. Thirdly, organizing and directing people to implement the plans that achieve the goals. And fourth, critical element of management is measuring progress towards those goals. Let's look at each element individually now. A team has to have a goal. It has to be something you're trying to accomplish, even if it's to maintain operational excellence, even if you're not trying to change anything. Um, so goals can be handed down to the manager of a team, or they can be set by the manager of the team if that's what their, their management has asked of them. But the, but the goal has to exist first. Now, goals have to have a couple of different characteristics in order to be useful, in order to be achievable. They have to be realistic. You can't say you're going to do something that's impossible or, or very unlikely to be achieved. So they have to be realistic, and they have to be very specific. You, know, you can't simply say, oh, we're going to be uh, the best fire company in the department. Because there's no way to really measure that. So they need to be specific because they need to be measurable. Every time you state a goal, you also have to state two other things. One of them is how you're going to measure your accomplishment of that goal. That is how you know when you've achieved it. You know, what, is, what is the criteria by which we know we've accomplished the goal? Now, even soft goals can be measured. Let's go back to the example I just gave you. We're going to be the best uh, fire company in the department. Well, that's probably a little too soft to be measured. But if, for instance, you said we're going to measure best by these three specific attributes are response time, physical fitness, et cetera, et cetera. If you had very specific things, then that would be an OK goal. On the other hand, if you said, say you're in the uh, police service and you want to, your goal is to improve community relations, well, just by itself, that's too soft to be measured. But just because it's soft doesn't mean you can't put some kind of measurement on it. Even soft goals can be measured if you take the time to do it. So in that case, you would say, our goal is to, be, is to improve community relations, and we're going to measure it with a public opinion survey you know, administered by such and such a group. That would be a way to do it. Now, that may not be a good way to measure it or not, but at least you've given a specific measurement, a specific measurement uh, method to that fairly soft goal. The second thing each goal has to include as, par as part of it, so there are the three things, it's the goal, there's how you're going to measure it, and the third thing is what time frame you're going to complete it in. We're going to accomplish X, we're going to measure it by this criteria, and it's going to be accomplished at or by this time. Our goal without a time frame is not a goal, it's just a wish. The second primary task of managers is to formulate plans to achieve the goals that they have set or that has been handed down to them. 
Now, formulating plans is nothing more than defining the set of actions or the set of sub-goals that need to be accomplished in order for your goal to be accomplished on an overall basis. This obviously comes from experience and, and skill, but it, it, it's not that hard of a task. Just break things down into a series of steps. Once you've done that, then you need to define the linkages between those sub-goals or those actions. You know, defining the actions or the sub-goals is pretty easy. Most, most people can do that just based on their experience and intuition. However, once you start to define the linkages between them, it gets a little more complicated. You know, for, in order to accomplish goal, the, the big goal X for my team, I need to accomplish these, say, five sub-goals, or, or I need to do these five tasks. That's fairly easy. But now these five tasks depend on each other in some way. They're competing for resources. They're competing for time. Uh, they, they, some may need to be accomplished in parallel, some uh, sequentially. That's the kind of thing that gets a little tricky and requires a little more management skill. It's defining the linkages between these. And one way you can do this for something complex is to use a project plan. Uh, oftentimes, if it's simpler, you can just do it on the back of a napkin. The reason you need to break down the, act, the individual actions you need to take and the linkages between them is so that you can resolve the contradictions between them. If you just charge ahead trying to accomplish each sub-goal, pretty soon, in most cases, pretty soon you're either going to have chaos on your hand or your people are going to be coming to you and say, I can't do this, I can't do what I need to do because Joe's team is, is, has a resource I need or Mary's team is taking up time or I need Mary and she's doing something else. So you need to now resolve the contradictions uh, between those linkages and, and make them rational. And you may not be able to do that perfectly. Ch you know, chances are you won't. But you need to choose the most optimal set of linkages, that is, the least number of contradictions, so that you can accomplish your goal in the best possible way. So it's important to realize that setting up a set of plans to accomplish a goal is more than just defining the actions that you need to take. It's digging down deeper and understanding how things can go wrong, how things will start to compete against each other, and how resources will become unavailable as you charge ahead on all of these paths simultaneously. And this takes some skill and some experience. The third major thing that management does is managers organize and direct people in order to accomplish the plans that accomplish the goal. Now, there's a critical order in which you organize and direct people. And the first is you have to organize the tasks and the resources. You have to chunk up the tasks that you're trying to accomplish and the resources you're going to use to accomplish those into identifiable, discrete chunks. So you know what's what, what corresponds to what, what resources are going to get used when by what task. And of course, as we described earlier, what the contradictions between them are. Then, and only then, should you start assigning responsibility for each task to a person. If you assign people to a task before you understand how the tasks are chopped up and the resources they're going to need, you could easily wind up assigning the wrong task to the wrong person. It happens all the time. And then, finally, after you've got the right person assigned to the right task, then you need to provide leadership and supervision to the team, which includes motivating them. But if you don't do things in this order, if you, if you just jump ahead and say, hey, Joe, you take, out, you take this, uh, rather than understanding the bigger task that Joe is part of, the bigger goal, the bigger way that the tasks are chunked up to accomplish the goal, then you could easily run into a problem where Joe isn't the right person. You know, there's an old saying that says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And that's true. If you can't measure what's going on, you can't determine if progress is being made or what's happening. And the fourth critical element, the fourth thing that management does is they measure progress towards the goal. You know, as we described, you've got a goal that your team has. You've chunked that up into subtasks. Each one of these subtasks may have sub-subtasks, but each one of the tasks at whatever level has milestones that need to be achieved. You need to, you need to define those milestones. And then you need to periodically, at the right times, make sure those milestones are being reached. You don't want to get to the end of a, of a long process and say, gosh, you know, way, way 12 months ago, you know, we started to fall short and not meet our, our objectives. You want to be measuring it at an appropriate time, which is, which is you know, usually, usually pretty close, at least every week in most cases, measuring progress towards your goal and making corrective actions if you aren't. And this is where a lot of teams and a lot of managers fall short, is they let this measurement just slide by. You know, they may say, hey, Joe, how you doing? And he goes, okay, I'm doing fine. And that's, and that's as much 
measurement as the manager applies to the task, when in fact you need to say, Joe, this is week three. By week three, you should have accomplished X. Has X been accomplished? And if not, then you dig down and find out why. Now, on some tasks, you may need to construct a measurement system that doesn't already exist in order to figure out if you're making progress or not. I mean, you may need to figure out an accounting system or a personnel system or some other kind of reporting system to give you the data to know whether you're accomplishing the task or not. And when you chunk the task up, as we described earlier, when you chunk the goal into task, part of that is understanding, part of that chunking process is to understand how you're gonna measure the accomplishment of each subtask and what measurement systems, what information systems you need to do that and to realize that if you need to construct a measurement system or an information system, say a reporting system from IT, that that needs to be included as part of the resources you need and part of the time frame that's required to complete the project. It's often said that what managers actually do is make decisions. Managers may or may not be involved in actually doing the tasks that their teams do, but primarily what they do is they make decisions. If you look back at the four elements of management that we just discussed, most of that activity reduces to making decisions such as, is the goal correct? Is the goal sufficiently defined? Are we on the right path, et cetera? So making decisions and having decision-making ability is an important element of management. Making good decisions depends on your knowledge and experience and your judgment. That we can't give you. That has to come from your experience. However, you have to have decisiveness in order to make good decisions too. You have to know when enough information is enough and you move on. There's never 100% of the information that you need at your fingertips in order to make the perfect decision. Yet decisions constantly have to be made. And a good manager knows when enough is enough. A rule of thumb is when you've got about 80% of the information that you would ideally have to make a decision, that's probably enough to make a reasonable decision. Uh, if, you, if you wait to get much more information, you're just going to drag things on in most cases. Rule of thumb, not always applicable. What good managers do is they realize when enough is enough, they make the decision and they move on. They don't second guess themselves. That's what decisiveness is all about and that is a characteristic of most high performance teams with high performance managers. Management is a separate function from doing the task. We used to believe, that is academics used to believe 50 years ago, that a good manager could manage anything. So long as you had the skills of management, it didn't matter what task you were managing. You could manage a hospital or you could manage a police force. Well, we now know that's not true. You need to have some competence and a good deal of familiarity with the tasks that are being done. So a good police manager is gonna definitely come out of the police service and a good hospital manager is gonna definitely come out of the hospital service. But managing and doing are not the same thing. They are different sets of skills. The best doer may not be the best manager. We can probably see this most clearly if we talk about the public sector function of sales. You know, the, the best salesman is not the best sales manager. The best salesman has got a set of skills revolving around account management and prospecting and people skills and sales skills, whereas the best sales manager has a set of skills revolving around project management and budgeting and resource allocation. You can see that they're different. And the same applies in the public sector. The very, your very best patrolman may not make your best sergeant. Your very best firefighter may not make your best captain. So uh, now, obviously, there's going to be some correlation there, but understand that managing and doing are separate skills. And if you want to be a good manager, you need to develop some management skills in addition to your functional skills. Critical. It's absolutely critical for managers to realize that once they become a manager, they disappear. They become irrelevant. It's all about their team. The manager doesn't accomplish anything. Remember, managers accomplish things through people. So managers don't accomplish anything. Managers don't accomplish goals or tasks. Their team does. And the team always gets credit for it. A good example or a good symptom of a poor manager is one that gets up and takes credit for, the, for his or her team's performance. A good manager gets up and gives credit to the team and doesn't even bother to mention themselves. Remember, the focus is on the team. It's all about the team. It's no longer about you once you're a manager. You know, managers get paid more than their subordinates as a rule. With this privilege of extra pay comes some responsibility. And in fact, a manager is responsible for the activities of his or her team. A manager never blames their subordinates for the failure of the team. Even if one of your people screws up, 
it's still your screw up because you're in charge of the team. It's your screw up because you put that person on the team or it's your screw up because you devise the processes by, that that person followed or didn't follow or you devise the processes to make sure that your people were following the correct procedure or process. The person in charge is the person responsible. This is one of the fundamental rules of management. And if you can't live by it, don't become a manager. The person in charge is the person responsible, period, with one exception. And that exception is when your authority is not commensurate with your responsibility. One of the fundamental rules of management is that when you assign people a task, when you assign them a responsibility for a task, you have to give them the authority to accomplish the task. Now in the private sector, that's easy. Private sector employers can rearrange their management systems and their personnel and their reward systems and their compensation systems at will to accomplish um, whatever management scheme they set up. In the public sector, that's a little harder. You, know, you may be responsible for a team of people, but you don't have complete control over that team of people. For instance, maybe you can't hire and fire people into your team. You know, we're constrained by union rules, by civil service rules, by, by contracts, etc. So in that case, you get a little leeway for not being fully responsible for everything your team does. So how do we resolve these two issues? One, that the person in charge is the person responsible, and two, that sometimes in the private sector, excuse me, in the uh, public sector, authority isn't always commensurate with responsibility. Well, the only way we can really deal with that is to make clear to our supervisors what our recommendations are, even if we can't implement them. You know, I recommend that um, Joe or Mary be demoted or fired or removed from the team, even if you can't do that. Define the consequences for your management of not following your recommendations and document everything. Just leave a clear trail as to what you thought the right decision was, even if you couldn't fully implement it. I think that's the best we can do in the public sector under these circumstances. There are two conceptual overlapping areas uh, in management that you'll run into, effectiveness versus efficiency. You need to be concerned with both. Uh, it's helpful to understand what you're trying to accomplish at any time. Effectiveness is making sure the right thing gets done. Efficiency is making sure that whatever you're doing gets done in the most cost-effective manner possible. And sometimes we can get so focused on efficiency that we forget to think about effectiveness. We can get so focused on doing something in the most resource uh, effective way possible that we forget to ask ourselves, wait a minute, is this really what we should be doing at this time? So remember now and then to step back and understand at any given time or any given month or year what you're focusing on. Is it effectiveness or efficiency and is that the right focus, the right balance for you during that time period? If you look at the list of characteristics on slide 21 that a good manager has, you're going to see the left-hand column, maturity, responsibility, uh, rationality, integrity, fairness, consistency, um, that pretty much maps to what we described a good leader needs in our leadership program. But in addition, there are some other skills that a good manager should have, or that someone should have before they jump into management. I mean, you need to have some people skills, because you're dealing with, you're managing people, obviously, so you need to be able to communicate effectively.